All right, everybody, welcome back to some more Mass Effect. Today we are going to be going through the Codex, what we have gotten so far. Uh, don't know if I'll split the video shit up between primary and secondary. Um, primary, I'm just going to kind of cycle through them. I might make comments here and there. But yeah, we're just going to... I know that some people... You can probably find it anywhere, but in case you haven't seen it, um, go through it. So yeah we got a lot of stuff here to cover here so let's start with the council races the asari were the first species to discover the citadel when the salarians arrived it was the asari who proposed the establishment of the citadel council to maintain peace throughout the galaxy since then the asari have served as the mediators and centrists of the council an all-female race the asari reproduce through a form of parthenogenesis they can attune their nervous system to that of another individual of any gender and of any species to reproduce. This capability has led to the unseemly and inaccurate rumors about Asari promiscuity. Asari can live for over a thousand years, passing through three stages of life. In the maiden stage, they wander restlessly, seeking new knowledge and experience. When the matron stage begins, they meld with interesting partners to produce their offspring. This ends when they reach the matriarch stage, where they assume the roles of leaders and counselors. All right. The second species to join the Citadel, the Salarians are warm-blooded amphibians with a hyperactive metabolism. Salarians think fast, talk fast, and move fast. To Salarians, other species seem sluggish and dull-witted. Unfortunately, their metabolic speed leaves them with a relatively short lifespan. Salarians over the age of 40 are a rarity. The Salarians were responsible for advancing the development of the primitive Krogan species to use as soldiers during the Rachni Wars. They were also behind the creation of the Genophage bioweapon the Turians used to quell the Krogan rebellion several centuries later. Salarians are known for their observational capability and non-linear thinking. This manifests as an aptitude for research and espionage, they are constantly experimenting and inventing, and it is generally accepted that they always know more than they are letting on. That bit about the uh, Rakdai Wars and the Krogan Rebellions and the Genophage are pretty important. Just in general. Roughly 1,200 years ago, the Turians were invited to join the Citadel Council to fulfill the role of galactic peacekeepers. The Turians have the largest fleet in Citadel space, and they make up the single largest portion of the Council's military forces. As their territory and influence has spread, the Turians have come to rely on the Salarians for military intelligence and the Asari for diplomacy. Despite a somewhat colonial attitude towards the rest of the galaxy, the ruling hierarchy understands they would lose more than they would gain if the other two races were ever removed. Turians come from an autocratic society that values discipline and possesses a strong sense of personal and collective honor. There is lingering animosity between Turians and humans over the First Contact War of 2157, which is known as the Relay 314 incident to the Turians. Officially, however, the two species are allies, and they enjoy civil, if cool, diplomatic relations. Yeah, Turians and humans really haven't gotten past the First Contact War at this point. Um, over the course of the games, that'll change. But, uh, yeah, Turians are soldier boys. The Asari. In a nutshell. Extinct races. 50,000 years ago, the Protheans were the only spacefaring species in the galaxy. They vanished in a swift galactic extinction. Only the legacy of their empire remains. They are believed to have built the mass relays and the Citadel, which have allowed numerous species to explore and expand throughout the galaxy. Prothean ruins are found on worlds across the galaxy. While surprisingly intact for their age, functioning examples of Prothean paleotechnology are rare. Time and generations of looters have picked their dead cities and derelict stations clean. Some believe the Protheans meddled in the evolution of younger races. The Hanar homeworld of Kaje, for example, shows clear evidence of former Prothean occupation. The presence of a former Prothean observation post on Mars has caused a rebirth of interventionary evolutionists among humans. These individuals believe the god myths of ancient civilizations are misremembered encounters with aliens. Interesting. 
Though now extinct, the rachni once threatened every species in citadel space. Over 2,000 years ago, explorers foolishly opened a mass relay to a previously unknown system and encountered something never seen before or since, a species of spacefaring insects guided by a hive mind intelligence. Unfortunately, the rachni were not peaceful and the galaxy was plunged into a series of conflicts known as the Rachni Wars. Attempts to negotiate were futile, as it was impossible to make contact with the hive queens that guided the race from beneath the surface of their toxic home world. The emergence of the Krogan ended the Rachni Wars. Bred to survive the harshest environments, the Krogan were able to strike at the queens in their lairs and reclaim conquered council worlds. But when Krogan fleets pressed them back to their homeworld, the Rachni refused to surrender, and the Krogan eradicated them from the galaxy. Very important bit of information there. Fifth. All right, non-council races. In the early 2160s, the Alliance began aggressive colonization of worlds in the Skillian Verge, much to the dismay of the Batarians, who had been developing the region for several decades. In 2171, the Batarians petitioned the Council to declare the Verge a zone of Batarian interest. The Council refused, however, declaring unsettled worlds in the region open to human colonization. In protest, the Batarians closed their Citadel Embassy and severed official diplomatic relations with the Council, effectively becoming a rogue state. They instigated a proxy war in the Verge by funneling money and weapons to criminal organizations urging them to strike at human colonies. Hostilities peaked with the Skillian Blitz of 2176, an attack on the human capital of Elysium by Batarian-funded pirates and slavers. In 2178, the Alliance retaliated with a crushing assault on the moon of Torfin, long used as a staging base by Batarian-backed criminals. In the aftermath, the Batarians retreated into their own systems and are now rarely seen in Citadel space. Batarians and humans have lots of beef, and Batarians kind of are not viewed well by uh, the other council races. The Elcor are a citadel species native to the high gravity world Dakuna. They are massive creatures, standing on four muscular legs for increased stability. Elcor move slowly, an evolved response to an environment where a fall can be lethal. This has colored their psychology, making them deliberate and conservative. Elcor's speech is ponderous and monotone. Among themselves, scent, slight movements, and subvocalized infrasound convey shades of meaning that make a human smile seem as subtle as a fireworks display. Since their subtlety can lead to misunderstandings with other species, the Elcor often go out of their way to clarify when they are being sarcastic, amused, or angry. Dakuna's high gravity impedes mountain formation, most of the world consists of flat, open plains, which prehistoric Elcor wandered across in small family bands. Modern Elcor still prefer open sky and can become restless and uncomfortable on long starship journeys. Very interesting race, the Elcor. Next. The Geth are a humanoid race of networked AIs. They were created by the Quarians 300 years ago as tools of labor and war. When the Geth showed signs of self-evolution, the Quarians attempted to exterminate them. The Geth won the resulting war. This example has led to legal, systematic repression of artificial intelligences in galactic society. The Geth possess a unique distributed intelligence. An individual has rudimentary animal instincts, but as their numbers and proximity increase, the apparent intelligence of each individual improves. In groups, they can reason, analyze situations, and use tactics, as well as any organic race. Geth space is located at the trailing end of the Perseus arm, beyond the lawless Terminus systems. The Perseus veil, an obscuring dark nebula of opaque gas and dust, lies between their space and the Terminus systems. Not a very friendly area. The Hanar are a citadel species known for excessive politeness. They speak with scrupulous precision and take offense at improper language. 
Hanar that expect to deal with other species take special courses to help them unlearn their tendency to take offense at improper speech. All Hanar have two names. The face name is known to the world. The soul name is kept for use among close friends and relations. Hanar never refer to themselves in the first person in conversation with someone they know on a face name basis. To do so is considered egotistical. So instead they refer to themselves as this one or the impersonal it. Their home world, Kaje, has 90% ocean cover and orbits an energetic white star, resulting in a permanent blanket of cloud. Due to the presence of Prothean ruins on the world, many Hanar worship them, and Hanar myths often speak of an elder race that civilized them by teaching them language. All right, next. When the Asari discovered the Citadel, they also discovered the Keepers, a docile, multi-limbed insect race that seemingly exists only to maintain and repair the great Prothean station. Early attempts to communicate with or study the Keepers were failures, and it is now illegal to interfere with or impede Keeper activity. Because they are completely non-threatening, Keepers have become virtually invisible to everyone else. Similarly, they seem indifferent to other species, except for their tendency to help new arrivals integrate themselves into the Citadel. No matter how many Keepers die due to old age, violence, or accident, they maintain a constant number. No one has discovered the source of new Keepers, but some hypothesize they are genetic constructs. Biological androids created somewhere deep in the inaccessible core of the Citadel itself. Kind of creepy that nobody has figured any of that out. <laughs> Let's continue. The Krogan evolved in a hostile and vicious environment. Until the invention of gunpowder weapons, eaten by predators was still the number one cause of Krogan fatalities. Yikes. Afterwards, it was death by gunshot. <laughs> when the Salarians discovered them, the Krogan were a brutal, primitive species, struggling to survive a self-inflicted nuclear winter. The Salarians culturally uplifted them, teaching them to use and build modern technology so they could serve as soldiers in the Rachni War. Liberated from the harsh conditions of their homeworld, the quick breeding Krogan experienced an unprecedented population explosion. They began to colonize nearby worlds. Even though these worlds were already inhabited, the Krogan rebellions lasted nearly a century. Only ending when the Turians unleashed the Genophage, a Salarian developed bioweapon that crushed all Krogan resistance. The Genophage makes only one in a thousand pregnancies viable, and today the Krogan are a slowly dying breed. Understandably, the Krogan harbor a grudge against all other species, especially the Turians. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us would if that happened to them. A lot of uh, important things in that one as well. Driven from their home system by the Geth nearly three centuries ago, most Quarians now live aboard the Migrant Fleet, a flotilla of 50,000 vessels ranging in size from passenger shuttles to mobile space stations. Home to 17 million Quarians, the flotilla understandably has scarce resources. Because of this, each Quarian must go on a rite of passage known as the Pilgrimage when they come of age. They leave the fleet and only return once they have found something of value they can bring back to their people. Other species tend to look down on the Quarians for creating the Geth and for the negative impact their fleet has when it enters a system. This has led to many myths and rumors about the Quarians, including the belief that underneath their clothes and breathing masks, they are actually cybernetic creatures, a combination of organic and synthetic parts. Fringe racism. Here's his head. But I mean, also, created evil AI, possibly, so. Meh. The Volus are a member species of the Citadel with their own embassy, but they are also a client race of the Turians. Centuries ago, they were voluntarily absorbed into the hierarchy, effectively trading their mercantile prowess for Turian military protection. Erun, their homeworld, lies far beyond the normal life zone of its star. However, the world has a high-pressure greenhouse atmosphere that traps enough heat to support an ammonia-based biochemistry. As a result, the Volus must wear pressure suits and breathers when dealing with other species, as conventional nitrogen-oxygen air mixtures are poisonous to them 
and in the low pressure atmospheres tolerable to most species, their flesh will actually split open. Volus culture is tribal, bartering lands and even people to gain status. This culture of exchange inclines them to economic pursuits. It was the Volus who authored the Unified Banking Act, and they continue to monitor and balance the Citadel economy. Very unique, the Volus and the Elkor. All right, non-sapient creatures. After the Geth secure a location, they round up an impaled dead and living bodies on mechanical spikes. The spikes rapidly transform these victims into withered husks, extracting water and trace minerals, and replacing them with cybernetics. The cybernetics reanimate the lifeless flesh and tissue, transforming the bodies into mindless killing machines. Some Alliance soldiers refer to the husk-generating spikes as dragon's teeth, a reference to the mythological berserkers who sprang up from the earth wherever the teeth of the dragon Eris were planted. Dragon's teeth and husks bear little resemblance to other pieces of Geth technology. No one is sure why a synthetic race would bother to drain the minuscule amount of recoverable resources from organic corpses, though the value of reusing them as shock troops is obvious. Yeah. Kind of subtle hints there that maybe this isn't Geth technology. Thresher maws are subterranean carnivores that spend their entire lives eating or searching for something to eat. Threshers reproduce via spores that can lie dormant for millennia, yet are robust enough to survive prolonged periods in deep space and atmospheric re-entry. As a result, thresher spores appear on many worlds, spread by previous generations of space travelers. The body of a thresher never entirely leaves the ground. Only the head and tentacles erupt from the earth to attack. In addition to physical attacks, Threshers have the ability to project toxic chemicals and emit bursts of infrasound as a shockwave weapon. The Alliance first encountered Threshers on the colony of Akuz in 2177. After contact was lost with the Pioneer team, Marine units were deployed to investigate. The shore parties were set upon by hungry Threshers, and nearly the entire assault force was killed. Alliance forces recommend engaging Threshers with vehicle-mounted heavy weapons. Yeah, take you one out on a uh, foot. Hard as balls. After the get. All right, Citadel and Galactic Government. The Citadel is an ancient deep space station, presumably constructed by the Protheans. Since the Prothean extinction, numerous species have come to call the Citadel home. It serves as the political, cultural, and financial capital of the galactic community. To represent their interests, most species maintain embassies on the Presidium, the Citadel's inner ring. The Citadel Tower in the center of the Presidium holds the Citadel Council Chambers. Council affairs often have far-reaching effects on the rest of the galactic community. Five arms, known as the Wards, extend from the Presidium. Their inner surfaces have been built into cities, populated by millions of inhabitants from across the galaxy. The Citadel is virtually indestructible. If attacked, the station can close its arms to form a solid, impregnable shell. For as long as the station has existed, an enigmatic race called the Keepers has maintained it. All right, the Citadel Council. The Council is an executive committee composed of representatives from the Asari Republic's the Turian hierarchy, and the Salarian Union. Though they have no official power over the independent governments of other species, the Council's decisions carry great weight throughout the galaxy. No single Council race is strong enough to defy the other two, and all have a vested interest in compromise and cooperation. Each of the Council species has general characteristics associated with the various aspects of governing the galaxy. The Asari are typically seen as diplomats and mediators. The Salarians gather intelligence and information. The Turians provide the bulk of the military and peacekeeping forces. Any species granted an embassy on the Citadel is considered an associate member, bound by the accords of the Citadel conventions. Associate members may bring issues to the attention of the Council, though they have no input on the decision. 
the Human Systems Alliance became an associate member of the Citadel in 2165. All right, Citadel Space. Citadel Space is an unofficial term referring to any region of space controlled by a species that acknowledges the authority of the Citadel Council. At first glance, it appears this territory encompasses most of the galaxy. In reality, however, less than 1% of the stars have been explored. Even Mass Effect FTL Drive is slow relative to the volume of the galaxy. Empty space and systems without suitable drive discharge sites are barriers to exploration. Only the mass relays allow ships to jump hundreds of light years in an instant, the key to expanding across an otherwise impassable galaxy. Whenever a new relay is activated, the destination system is rapidly developed. From that hub, FTL drive is used to expand to nearby star clusters. The result is a number of densely developed clusters, thinly spread across the vast expanse of space, connected by the mass relay network. All right, the Spectres. Spectres are agents from the Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance and answer only to the Citadel Council. They are elite military operatives, granted the authority to deal with threats to peace and stability in whatever way they deem necessary. They operate independently or in groups of two or three. Some are empathetic peacekeepers, resolving disputes through diplomacy. Others are cold-blooded assassins, ruthlessly dispatching problem individuals. All get the job done one way or another, often operating outside the bounds of galactic law. The Spectres were founded after the Salarians joined the Council. For many years, they operated in secrecy as backroom problem solvers. Only after the Krogan rebellions did their activities become publicized. Assignment of a Spectre is less contentious than a military deployment, but makes it clear that the Council is concerned about a situation. Yeah, pretty fair. All right. Um, let's get into the history of the Humanity and the Systems Alliance. The home world and capital of humanity is entering a new golden age. The resource wealth of a dozen settled colonies and a hundred industrial outposts flows back to Earth, fueling great works of industry, commerce, and art. The great cities are greening as arcology skyscrapers and telecommuting allow more efficient use of land. Earth is still divided among nation states, though all are affiliated beneath the overarching banner of the Systems Alliance. While every human enjoys a longer and better life than ever, the gap between rich and poor widens daily. Advanced nations have eliminated most genetic disease and pollution. Less fortunate regions have not progressed beyond 20th century technology and are often smog-choked, overpopulated slums. Sea levels have risen two meters in the last 200 years, and violent weather is common due to environmental damage inflicted during the late 21st century. The past few decades, however, have seen significant improvement due to recent technological advances. Yeah, I mean, even in sci-fi, man, we, we're pretty fucking stupid, but... All right, let's go on. The Systems Alliance is an independent supranational government representing the interests of humanity as a whole. The Alliance is responsible for the governance and defense of all extrasolar colonies and stations. The Alliance grew out of the various national space programs as a matter of practicality. Sol's planets had been explored and exploited through piecemeal national efforts. The expense of colonizing entire new solar systems could not be met by any one country. With humans knowing that alien contact was inevitable, there was enough political will to jointly fund an international effort. Still, the Alliance was often disregarded by those on Earth until the first contact war. While the national governments dithered and bickered over who should lead the effort to liberate Shanxi, the Alliance fleet struck decisively. Post-war public approval gave the Alliance the credibility to establish its own parliament and become the galactic face of humanity. Nice. All right, planets and locations. Pharos is a habitable world in the Attican Beta Cluster. Two thirds of the habitable surface is covered with the ruins of a crumbling Prothean megatropolis. In the millennia since the Prothean extinction, the ruins have been repeatedly picked over by looters many times. 
Pharos was considered a poor prospect for colonization, as little open ground remains for agriculture. The only sizable freshwater sources are the poles, which are tapped by the decaying Prothean aqueduct systems. The dead cities, while in good condition considering their antiquity, are of uncertain stability. Ground level is congested by a dozen meters of fallen debris, and the air is fouled by dust. In 2178, the Human Exogeny Corporation announced its intention to place a permanent colony on Pharos to thoroughly explore the ruins. The pioneer settlement was placed on the upper levels of several intact skyscrapers, using the surviving Prothean aqueducts and rooftop hydroponic gardens to support the population. All right. No Novaria area. is a cool, rocky world with most of its hydrosphere locked up in massive glaciers. A privately chartered colony world, the planet is owned by the Novaria Development Corporation Holding Company. The NDC is funded by investment capital from two dozen high technology development firms and administrated by an executive board representing their interests. The investors built remote hot labs in isolated locations across Novaria's surface. These facilities are used for research too dangerous or controversial to be performed elsewhere, as Novaria is technically not part of Citadel space and therefore exempt from council law. By special arrangement, Citadel special tactics and reconnaissance agents have been granted extraterritorial privileges, but it remains to be seen how committed the executive board is to that principle. Given its unique situation, it is understandable that Novaria is often implicated in all manner of wild conspiracy theories. Yeah, not not a not a great spot, not gonna lie. The terminus systems are located on the far side of the Attican Traverse, beyond the space administered by the Citadel Council or claimed by the Human Systems Alliance. It is populated by a loose affiliation of minor species. United only in their refusal to acknowledge the political authority of the Council or adhere to the Citadel Conventions. Their independence comes at a price. The Terminus is fraught with conflict. War among the various species is common, as governments and dictators constantly rise and fall. The region is a haven for illegal activities, particularly piracy and the slave trade. At least once a year, a fleet from the Terminus invades the nearby Attican Traverse. These attacks are typically small raids against poorly defended colonies. The Council rarely retaliates, as sending patrols into the Terminus systems could unify the disparate species against their common foe, triggering a long and costly war. There are between two and four hundred billion stars in the galaxy, and less than one percent of them have ever been visited or had their systems properly surveyed. Humanity's early expansion into the Attican Traverse was haphazard, a desperate race to claim habitable planets where populations can be economically settled. Ignored in the wake of this land grab were thousands of less hospitable worlds, each potentially rich with industrial resources. The wealth of entire solar systems lies untapped, waiting for corporate survey teams or independent pioneers to discover and exploit them. However, this is not an easy task. In addition to the environmental hazards, the fact that uncharted worlds are largely ignored makes them popular bases for criminals, revolutionaries, cults, and others who wish to remain unnoticed by galactic society. Yeah. Unscrupulous individuals. All right, um, let's uh, do ships and vehicles. Faster than light drive, yeah, we got a lot element here. zero cores to reduce the mass of the ship, allowing higher rates of acceleration. This effectively raises the speed of light within the mass effect field, allowing high speed travel with negligible relativistic time dilation effects. Starships still require conventional thrusters, chemical rockets, commercial fusion torch, economy ion engine, or military anti-proton drive, in addition to the FTL drive core. With only a core, a ship has no motive power. The amount of ESO and power required for a drive increases exponentially to the mass being moved and the degree it is being lightened. Very massive ships or very high speeds are prohibitively expensive. 
If the field collapses while the ship is moving at faster than light speed, the effects are catastrophic. The ship is snapped back to sublight velocity, the enormous excess energy shed in the form of lethal Cherenkov radiation. Yikes. All right. Larger warships are generally classified in one of four weights. Frigates are small, fast ships used for scouting and screening of larger vessels. Frigates often operate in wolf pack flotillas. Cruisers are middleweight combatants, faster than dreadnoughts and more heavily armed than frigates. Cruisers are the standard patrol unit and often lead frigate flotillas. Dreadnoughts are kilometer-long capital ships mounting heavy, long-range firepower. They are only deployed for the most vital missions. Carriers are dreadnought-sized vessels that also carry large numbers of fighters. Smaller vessels are almost exclusively used in a support role to the warships during combat. Fighters are one-man craft used to perform close-range attacks on enemy ships. Interceptors are one-man craft optimized for destroying opposing fighters. A little breakdown of how the navies work uh, in this galaxy. The Normandy. The Normandy is a prototype starship developed by the Human Systems Alliance with the assistance of the Citadel Council. It is optimized for scouting and reconnaissance missions in unstable regions using state-of-the-art stealth technology. For most ships, the heat generated through standard operations is easily detectable against the absolute zero background of space. The Normandy, however, is able to temporarily sink this heat within the hull. Combined with refrigeration of the exterior hull, the ship can travel undetected for hours or drift passively for days of covert observation. This is not without risk. The stored heat must eventually be radiated or it will build to levels capable of cooking the crew alive. Another component of the stealth system is the Normandy's revolutionary Tantalus Drive, a Mass Effect core twice the standard size. The Tantalus Drive generates mass concentrations that the Normandy falls into, allowing it to move without the use of heat-emitting thrusters. Yeah, this experimental thing could uh, cook us. I'm trying to think about that. Sure, we'll be fine. Ship mobility dominates space combat. The primary objective is to align the mass accelerator along the bow with the opposing vessel's broadside. Battles typically play out as artillery duels, fought at ranges measured in thousands of kilometers. Though assaults through defended mass relays often occur at knife fight ranges, as close as a few dozen kilometers. Most ship-to-ship -ship engagements are skirmishes between patrol vessels of cruiser weight and below, with dreadnoughts and carriers only deployed in full-scale fleet actions. Battles in open space are short and often inconclusive, as the weaker opponent typically disengages. Once a ship enters FTL flight, the combat is effectively over. There are no sensors capable of tracking them or weapons capable of damaging them. The only way to guarantee an enemy will stand and fight is to attack a location they have a vested interest in, such as a settled world or a strategically important mass relay. All right, we'll input into how uh, space combat works. Uh, the Mako. The Mako infantry fighting vehicle was designed for the System Alliance's frigates. Though the interior is cramped, an M35 is small enough to be carried in the cargo bay and easily deployed on virtually any world. With its turreted 155 mm mass accelerator and coaxially mounted machine gun, the Mako can provide a fire team with weapon support as well as mobility. Since Alliance Marines may be required to fight on any world, the Mako is environmentally sealed and equipped with microthrusters for use on low gravity planetoids. The Mako is powered by a sealed hydrogen-oxygen fuel cell and includes a small element zero core. While not large enough to nullify the vehicle's mass, the core can reduce it enough to be safely airdropped. When used in conjunction with thrusters, it also allows the Mako to extricate itself from difficult terrain. Very cool. All right, so we have two more tabs. I hope everybody's been taking notes on the important Biotics stuff. Biotics is the ability of rare individuals to manipulate dark energy 
and create mass effect fields through the use of electrical impulses from the brain. Intense training and surgically implanted amplifiers are necessary for a biotic to produce mass effect fields powerful enough for practical use. The relative strength of biotic abilities varies greatly among species and with each individual. There are three branches of biotics. Telekinesis uses mass lowering fields to levitate or impel objects. Mass raising kinetic fields are used to block or pin objects. Spatial distortion uses rapidly shifting mass fields to shred objects. Most organic species are capable of developing biotic abilities, though there are risks involved. Biotics are the result of an in utero exposure to element zero. This usually causes fatal cancers in the victim, but in rare cases, it coalesces into nodules within the fetus's developing nervous system. You know, pros, you get psychic powers. Cons, you get cancer. I mean, yeah, okay. An artificial intelligence is a self-aware computing system capable of learning and independent decision-making. Creation of a conscious AI requires adaptive code, a slow, expensive education, and a specialized quantum computer called a blue box. An AI cannot be transmitted across a communication channel or computer network. Without its blue box, an AI is no more than data files. Loading these files into a new blue box will create a new personality, as variations in the quantum hardware and runtime results create unpredictable variations. The geth serve as a cautionary tale against the dangers of rogue AI. And in Citadel space, they are technically illegal. Advocacy groups argue, however, that an AI is a living conscious entity, deserving the same rights as organics. They argue that continued use of the term artificial is institutionalized racism on the part of organic life. The term synthetic is considered the politically correct alternative. I mean, considering how much other racism exists in the uh, the council space, you know, I can see why this one might not be their top priority, but uh, yeah. A virtual intelligence is an advanced form of user interface software. VIs use a variety of methods to simulate natural conversation, including an audio interface and an avatar personality to interact with. Although a VI can provide a convincing emulation of sentience, they are not self-aware, nor can they learn or take independent action. VIs are used as operating systems on commercial and home computers. Minimal VI agents are also available. Agents are compact and specialized. Some serve as personal secretaries, filtering calls and scheduling meetings based on user-defined priorities. Others are advanced search engines, propagating themselves across the extranet to collate user-requested data. Commercial VIs in a variety of stock personalities are available at any software retailer. Boutique firms and hobbyists also build unique VIs to personal specification. Although software emulation of living personalities is illegal, reconstructions of famous historical figures are common. And no one was shocked. When subjected to an electrical current, the rare material dubbed element zero or ESO emits a dark energy field that raises or lowers the mass of all objects within it. This mass effect is used in countless ways, from generating artificial gravity to manufacturing high-strength construction materials. It is most prominently used to enable faster-than-light space travel. ESO is generated when solid matter, such as a planet, is affected by the energy of a star going supernova. The material is common in the asteroid debris that orbits neutron stars and pulsars. These are dangerous places to mine, requiring extensive use of robotics, telepresence, and shielding to survive the incredible radiation from the dead star. Only a few major corporations can afford the setup costs required to work these primary sources. Humanity discovered refined element zero at the Prothean Research Station on Mars allowing them to create mass effect fields and develop FTL travel. Hence the name of the game.
Element zero can increase or decrease the mass of a volume of space-time when subjected to an electrical current. With a positive current, mass is increased. With a negative current, mass is decreased. The stronger the current, the greater the magnitude of the dark energy mass effect. In space, low mass fields allow FTL travel and inexpensive surface to orbit transit. High mass fields create artificial gravity and push space debris away from vessels. In manufacturing, low mass fields permit the creation of evenly blended alloys, while high mass compaction creates dense, sturdy construction materials. The military makes extensive use of mobility-enhancing technologies, with mass effect utilizing fighting vehicles standard frontline issue in most military forces. Mass effect fields are also essential in the creation of kinetic barriers or shields to protect against enemy fire. Mass effect technology, super fucking important for space travel and pretty much most of council technology. Omni tools are handheld devices that combine a computer microframe, sensor analysis pack, and manufacturing fabricator. Versatile and reliable, an Omni tool can be used to analyze and adjust the functionality of most standard equipment, including weapons and armor, from a distance. The fabrication module can rapidly assemble small three dimensional objects from common reusable industrial plastics, ceramics, and light alloys. This allows for field repairs and modifications to most standard items, as well as the reuse of salvaged equipment. Omni tools are standard issue for soldiers and first in colonists. All right. One more tab, weapons, armor, and equipment. Combat hard suits use a dual layer system to protect the wearer. The inner layer consists of fabric armor with kinetic padding. Areas that don't need to be flexible, such as the chest or shins, are reinforced with sheets of lightweight ablative ceramic. The outer layer consists of automatically generated kinetic barriers. Objects traveling above a certain speed will trigger the barrier's reflex system and be deflected, provided there is enough energy left in the shield's power cell. Armored hard suits are sealable to protect the wearer from extremes of temperature and atmosphere. Standard equipment includes an onboard mini frame and a communications, navigation, and sensing suite. The mini frame is designed to accept and display data from a weapon's smart targeting system to make it easier to locate and eliminate enemies. All right. Kinetic barriers, aka shields. Kinetic barriers, more commonly called shields, provide protection against most mass accelerator weapons. Whether on a starship or a soldier's suit of armor, the basic principle remains the same. Kinetic barriers are repulsive mass effect fields projected from tiny emitters. These shields safely deflect small objects traveling at rapid velocities. This affords protection from bullets and other dangerous projectiles, but still allows the user to sit down without knocking away their chair. The shielding afforded by kinetic barriers does not protect against extremes of temperature, toxins, or radiation. Yep, just bullets. Medigel is a common medicinal salve used by paramedics, EMTs, and military personnel. It combines several useful applications, a local anesthetic, disinfectant, and clotting agent all in one. Once applied, the gel is designed to grip tight to flesh until subjected to a frequency of ultrasound. It is sealable against liquids, most notably blood, as well as contaminants and gases. The gel is a genetically engineered bioplasm created by the CERTA Foundation, a medical technology megacorp based on Earth. Technically, Medigel violates council laws against genetic engineering, but to date, it has proved far too useful to ban. Well, there you go. All modern infantry weapons, from pistols to assault rifles, use micro-scaled mass accelerator technology. Projectiles consist of tiny metal slugs suspended within a mass-reducing field, accelerated by magnetic force to speeds that inflict kinetic damage. The ammo magazine is a simple block of metal. The gun's internal computer calculates the mass needed to reach the target based on distance, gravity, and atmospheric pressure, then shears off an appropriate-sized slug from the block. 
A single block can supply thousands of rounds, making ammo a non-issue during any engagement. Top-line weapons also feature smart targeting that allows them to correct for weather and environment. Firing on a target in a howling gale feels the same as it does on a calm day at the practice range. Smart targeting does not mean a bullet will automatically find the mark every time the trigger is pulled. It only makes it easier for the marksman to aim. All right. That is all our primary excerpts. What is it? We've, that was 45 minutes? Well, let's just, let's just hop into it. Secondary. Personal history summary. Profile. This is just in case you have issues about uh, remembering how your shepherd's history goes. You were raised on Mindwar, on the fringes of the Attican Traverse. When you were 16, the colony was raided by slavers. The entire settlement was raised, and your friends and family were slaughtered. Passing Alliance Patrol rescued you, but all you loved was destroyed. All you loved was destroyed. You enlisted with the Alliance military, joining the long and bloody campaign to rid the Skilly and Verge of Batarian slavers and other criminal elements. The final battle came when Alliance forces laid siege to Torfin, a slayer, a slayer base, a slaver base built miles below the surface of a desolate moon. Superiority of the human fleet was wasted in the assault underground bunker, but you led a corps of elite ground troops into the heart of the enemy base. Nearly three quarters of your own squad perished in the vicious close quarters fighting. Cost and a cost you were willing to pay to make sure not a single slaver made it out of Torfin alive. Dark shit for Matthias Shepard. Alright. So we got a bunch of shit here. The sorry, culture. Because of their long life span of tart ah, because of their long lifespan, Asari tend to have a long view not common in other races. When they encounter a new species or situation, the Asari are more comfortable with an extended period of passive observation and study than immediate action. They are unfazed that some of their investments or decisions may not pay off for decades or centuries. Matriarchs can seem to make incomprehensible decisions, but their insight is evident when their carefully laid plans come to fruition. In interstellar relations, this long view manifests in an unspoken policy of centrism. The Azari instinctively seek to maintain stable balances of economic, political, and military power. Traditionally, Asari spread their influence through cultural domination and intellectual superiority. They invite new species of de advanced development to join the galactic community, knowing that their ideals and beliefs will inevitably influence the existing culture. Right, Salarians, League of One. Before they joined the Citadel Council, Salarians' most potent military tool was a small reconnaissance team known as the League of One. Their primary training was in espionage and assassination. Never more than a dozen strong, the team was adept at infiltrating the tightest defenses and eliminating all necessary obstacles. Only a few top members of government and military were privy to the League's identities. League members wore no distinguishable garments and held no particular rank. Only evidence of their participation in the League was a small medallion presented to each member upon induction. Secrecy was maintained until the formation of the council. Oh, wow. In an effort to dispel rumors and appease their new Asari partners, the Salarian Union released all classified documents pertaining to the League. The League of One was suddenly exposed and in danger of being hunted by enemies of the Salarians. Before any harm could be done, the team mysteriously disappeared. Most would assume this was a convenient lie to help hide their identities, but a few months later, the inner cabinet was murdered. Though there is no incriminating evidence, it is, was clear who was responsible. Realizing the threat posed by this rogue outfit, the special task group dispatched a team of hunters. When they didn't return, the STG dispatched ten of its brightest operatives with broad disc discretionary powers, only to return. They reported no evidence of the League. No further incidents were reported, and it was assumed the League was wiped out. Some recently declassified documents, however, have suggested there may have been a 13th member who eluded the Solarian military. 
Damn. Aryan culture. While Turians are individual with personal desires, their instinct is to equate the self with the group and set aside personal desires for the good of all. Turians are taught to have a strong sense of personal accountability, the Turian honor that other races find so remarkable. Turians are taught to own every decision they make, good or ill. The worst sin they can make in the eyes of their people is to lie about their own actions. Turians who murder will try to get away with it, but are directing questions, most will confess the crime. Well, that's one way to get around that. Turians have strong inclination toward public service and self-sacrifice, so they tend to be poor entrepreneurs. To compensate, they accepted the mercantile volus as a client race, offering protection in exchange for their fiscal, fiscal expertise. The Turian military is the center of their society. It is not just an armed force. It is an all-encompassing public works organization. The military police are also the civic police. The fire brigades serve the civilian population as well as military facilities. The Corps of Engineers builds and maintains spaceports, schools, water purification plants, and power stations. The Merchant Marine ensures that all worlds get needed resources. Very, very unique government. Military doctrine. Although they lack the brutality of the Krogan, the skill of the Asari, or the virtuosity of the humans. Yeah, okay. The Terrian military has formidable discipline. Officers and NCOs are lifers with years of field experience. Enlisted personnel are thoroughly trained and stay calm under fire. Terrian units don't break. Even if their entire line collapses, they'll they fall back in order, setting ambushes as they go. Up here saying holds, you will only see a Turian's back once he's dead. Boot camp begins on the 15th birthday. Soldiers receive a year of training before being assigned to a field unit. Officers train for even longer. Most serve until the age of 30, at which point they become part of the reserves. Even if they suffer injuries preventing frontline service, most do support work behind the lines. Oh wow. Biotics are uncommon. While admired for their exacting skills, biotics motiv motives are not always fully trusted by the common soldier. The Turians prefer to assign their biotics to specialist teams called cabals. Command and control is decentralized and flexible. Individual squads can call for artillery and air support. They make ex extensive use of combat drones for light duties and practice combined arms. Infantry operates with armor supported by overhead gunships. Strategically, they are methodical, impatient, and dislike risky operations. Tradition is important. Each legion has a full-time staff of historians who chronicle its battles, honors, in detail. It's cool going through this stuff again. The oldest have records dating back to the Turian Iron Age. If a legion is destroyed in battle, it's reconstituted rather than replaced. The Turian recruit auxiliary units from conquered or absorbed minor races. Auxiliaries are generally light infantry or armored cavalry units that screen and support the main terrain formations. At the conclusion of their service in the auxiliaries, recruits are gr yeah, gr recruits are granted terrain citizenship. Unification War. About the same time the Salarians and Asari were forming the council, the Turians were embroiled in a bitter civil war. The reunification war, as it was later named, began with the hostilities between the colonies further from the Turian homeworld Palavin. These colonies were run by local chieftains, many of whom had distanced themselves from the hierarchy. Without gal the galvanizing influence of the government, the colonies became increasingly isolated, and xenophobic colonists began wearing emblems of facial markings to differentiate themselves from members of other colonies, and open hostilities became common. When the war finally broke out, the hierarchy maintained strict diplomacy and refused to get involved. After several years of fighting, less than a dozen factions remained, and the hierarchy finally intervened. By that time, the chieftains were too weak to resist. They were forced to put an end to the fighting and renew their allegiance to the hierarchy. Though peace was restored, it took several decades of animosity to between colonists to fade completely. To this day, most Turians still wear facial markings of their home colonies. As a point of interest, the Turian term bareface refers to one who is beguiling or not to be trusted. It is also a slang term for politicians. Damn. 
Lots of crazy shit in Turian race uh, history. Alright. Extinct races. Secondary. Brothian Cypher. Brothian Beacon downloaded its knowledge into Lieutenant Commander Shepard on Eden Prime, causing confusing dreams and visions. While the imagery is becoming clearer with time, the meaning of the beacon communication remains elusive. It has been suggested that Prothean data recording is highly dependent on a certain point of view, what Carl Jung described as the collective unconsciousness. The cipher needed to comprehend the images implanted in Shepard's mind is the cultural knowledge of a Prothean. The archetypes, biological instincts, and common expert experiences universal to the race. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. Since Protheans have been dead for millennia, it may be impossible to acquire this cipher. Despite all the evidence confirming their existence of the the existence of the Protheans, little is known about their culture and society. From time to time, dig sites will yield new clues, but after fifty thousand years of decay, little or little of value is unearthed. Recent research has focused on the discovery of Prothean data disks. On their own, they are frail and rarely found in one place. Occasionally, however, an intact disk will be discovered within a console or reading device. To date, over three dozen disks have been recovered, and a few of those have been restored to the point where researchers can begin analyzing them. Can begin analyzing them. Yikes. So it may be some time before scientists discover a way to transfer the data off these disks. They are currently considered the most tangible leads for learning more about the Prothean culture. Mars Ruins. After 20 years of manned research outposts and nearly a century of robotic exploration, the European Space Agency's Lowell City became the first permanent settlement on Mars in 2103. Within a decade, the United States and China had founded permanent settlements as well. The South Polar region of Promethei Planum developed a Bermuda Triangle reputation. Satellites detected imminent mass con concentrations and magnetic field shifts. In 2148, prospectors working near Des Desiato Crater discovered an underground complex, a Prothean observation post. The odd phenomena were generated by the operation and discharge of the Mass Effect Corps, struggling to function despite 50 millennia of neglect. Earth was electrified by the news. Humanity was unequivocally not alone. While courts battled over who owned the ruins, the international scientific community coordinated a mass effort to access, translate, and interpret the data banks recovered from the facility. The facility provided proved to be a biosciences observation post built when Homo sapiens were first evolving on Earth. While the motives of the Prophets were not certain, translated records indicate that the facility was in regular communication with automated observation platforms in Earth orbit and on the lunar near side. The half dozen Mass Effect spaceships found in the facility were presumably used for first hand observation. The Prophets have been looking at humans for quite a, quite a bit. Alright. Non council races. Oh, fuck. Uh, I knew this was going to be a long one, but damn. All right. Start from the top. Geth armatures. Armatures are quadruped, all-terrain heavy weapon platforms akin to the armored fighting vehicles of other races. Geth being synthetic intelligences, armatures are not crude vehicles, but intelligent entities capable of independent decision-making and learning. Armatures are equipped with heavy kinetic barriers. Their, field, their main cannon mounted on their... On the articulated head turret appear to be a highly efficient conventional mass accelerator. It is capable of firing in anti-personnel and anti-tank modes. Some armatures carry drones into battle, presumably for reconnaissance purposes. Others host a swarm of insect-sized repair microbots. Hoppers. Fuck these things. Again, the GEF models, collectively dubbed hoppers by Alliance forces, are electronic warfare platforms. They can project electromagnetic radiation across a broad spectrum as an offensive weapon. They can also perform cyber warfare attacks against the onboard computers of body armor, hard suits, and weapons adversely affecting their performance. 
The structure of hoppers consists of advanced, highly elastic artificial muscle material. This allows a hopper to compress its entire body for powerful leaps. Hoppers also have thousands of molecule, molecule scale barbs on their surfaces of their hands and feet, which are used to cling to walls and ceilings. Hoppers are very difficult targets, leaping from one surface to another in rapid succession. The quarry would have no record of any GIF model similar to hoppers. The new morphotype must have been developed over the last 300 years by the GIF themselves. This is troubling proof that the GIF are continuing to move towards technological singularity. Experts in synthetic life, in synthetic life even, are intrigued by that hoppers appear to be even more organic than the baseline GIF. The identified subtypes of hopper have been known as codenames Sapper, Stalker, and Ghost. Horrifying. The Krogan Genophage. The Genophage bioweapon was created to end the Krogan rebellions. From the start, the Krogan had overwhelmed the Council. A one timely, only timely first contact with the Turians saved the Council races. The Turians fought with the Krogan to a standstill, but sheer weight of Krogan numbers indicated the war could not be won through conventional means. The Turians collaborated with the Salarians to genetically engineer a counter to the rapid breeding of the Krogan. The Genophage virus gained the energy to replicate by eating key genetic sequences. Every cell in the, every Krogan had to be altered for the weapon to be foolproof. Otherwise, the Krogan could have used gene therapy to fix the affected tissues. Once the Genophage strain could find no more genes to eat, it would starve and die, limiting spin-off mutation and contamination. This created genetic flaw is hereditary. The Salarians believed the Genophage would be used as a deterrent, a position the Turians viewed as naive. Once the project was complete, the Turians mass-produced it and deployed it. The Krogan homeworld, their colonies in all occupied worlds were infected. So it's like, the Salarians created a horrifying disease as like, we'll use this once and they'll stop. And the Turians were like, fuck that. Let's mass produce this shit and drop it on every Krogan baby we can. Yikes. The resulting mutation made only one in a thousand Krogan pregnancies carry to term. It did not reduce fertility, but offspring viability. The rare females able to carry children to term became prizes to Krogan warlords fought brutal battles over. The Krogan are a shadow of their former glory. While the rebellions took place centuries ago, they're constantly reminded of the horror of the genophage and of their inability to counter it. The release of the genophage is still controversial, bitterly debated in many circles, for obvious reasons that are obvious. On one hand, desperation. On the other hand, uh, systematic extinction and genocide. Hence, genophage. The Krogan Rebellions. After the Ragnar War, the quick breeding Krogan expanded at the expense of their neighbors. Warlords leveraged their veteran soldiers to seize living space while the council races were still grateful. Over centuries, the Krogan conquered world after world. There was always just one more needed. When the council finally demanded withdrawal from the Asari colony of Lucia, Krogan overlord Kredak stormed off, to the, off the citadel, daring the council to take their worlds back. But the council had taken precautions. The finest STG operators and Asari huntresses had been drafted into the covert observation force. The Office of Special Tactics and Reconnaissance, the Spectres, opened the war with crippling strategic strikes. Krogan planets went dark as computer viruses flooded the extranet. Sabotaged antimatter refineries disappeared in blue-white and blue-white annihilation. Headquarters stations shattered into orbit-clogging debris rammed by pre-placed suicide freighters. Still, this only delayed the inevitable. The war would have been lost if not for the first contact with the Turians, who responded to Krogan threats with a prompt declaration of war. Being on the far side of Krogan space from the Council, 
The Turians advanced rapidly into the lightly defended Krogan rear areas. The Krogan responded by dropping space stations and asteroids on Turian colonies. The three worlds were rendered completely uninhabitable. Because you don't fuck with the Krogan. This was precisely the wrong approach to take with the Turians. Each is first and foremost a public servant willing to risk his life to protect his comrades. Rather than increasing public war wariness, Krogan tactics stiffened Turian resolved. Because you dropped space stations on their colonies. The arrival of Turian task forces saved many worlds from the warlord's marauding fleets, but it took development of the genophage bioweapon to end the war. There were decades of unrest afterwards. Rogue warlords and holdout groups of insurgents refused to surrender or disappeared into the frontier systems to become pirates. Alright. Now the quarry has the economy. Migrantfleet has little economic base operating in the state of perpetual hand to mouth. While quarian ships include light manufacturing and assembly plants, they lack heavy industries such as refining and shipbuilding. The fleet has tankers for water purification and oxygen cracking, but the space intensive nature of agriculture limits food production. A single disaster could destroy the fragile balance. Quarians earn income in creative waves. Because the government is obliged to provide food, water, air, and medical support for every individual, the Conclave strategically determines the course of the fleet to bring in resources and income. A species who suspects the migrant fleet is heading towards their space often offers a gift of surplus starships, fuel, and resources to convince the Conclave to alter course. As the fleet passes through a system, swarms of mining vessels work over asteroids for metal and siliceous materials, and com com cometary that's what that word is cometary bodies for water ice and organics Quarian miners are adept at locating and strip mining spaceport resources these this sparks conflict with corporations already working with the system large mining con concerns spend millions on lobbyists and public relations portraying the Quarians as locusts devouring the resources of a system before moving on. The greatest assets of the Quarians is their rarefied skills. Most are experienced miners due to their life of perpetual salvage and repair. They are skilled engineers and technicians. More than once, they very, the very corporations that lobby against the Quarians have made backroom deals with the fleet, arranging for skilled Quarians to fill space engineering jobs that other species would demand higher wages for. Quarians are widely hated among the working classes. Quarians are coming to take our jobs is a common response to the fleet's approach. Uh, God. Due to the Quarians' precarious existence and the need to enforce strict rationing, the government is somewhat autocratic. The migrant fleet's operations are directed by the Admiralty. A board of five military officials were advised by a legislative body called the Conclave. Each vessel in the fleet has the right to send representatives to the Conclave aboard the flagship. The number of representatives is based on the crew size. Larger clans with bigger ships and more votes form the cores of political blocks. Opposition comes from the Outriders Coalition with delegates from thousands of smaller ships. The Admiralty defers to the Conflict Clave's decisions in most circumstances. However, if all five members agree that a Conclave decision jeopardizes the survival of the fleet and cannot get the Conclave to address their concerns, they have the right to summar summarily. Yeah, summarily. Summarily? I don't know why I'm having trouble with that. Overturn the legislative decision. After that, the Admiralty uses this extraordinary power, they must resign. If the Admiralty does not step down after using the veto, the result is of the military is obliged to arrest them. Each ship captain has the authority over his vessels, but is advised by an elected civilian council, just as the Admiralty is advised by the Conclave. This relationship may range from cooperation to polite tolerance to outright hostility, but any captain who overrules his council without a good reason is relieved of command by the Admiralty. 
Many Corian ships are owned by clans who pool their resources to purchase used vessels from private sellers. Large ships are prestigious for big, rich clans, but a small ship means status for a small clan with enough personal wealth to afford a private vessel. Clan vessel captains are not subject to dismissal by the Admiralty. Abusive captains are a family problem if they do not disrupt the operations of the fleet. So already, you can see a couple problems with that setup, but meh. Migrant Fleet. The Migrant Fleet is the largest concentration of star-faring vessels in the galaxy. Sprawling across billions of kilometers, it can take days for the entire fleet to pass through a mass relay. When the Quarians fled their homeworld, the fleet was a motley aggregation of freighters, shuttles, industrial vessels, and the odd warship. After three centuries, all have been modified to support larger crews as comfortably as possible. As the Quarians achieved stability, they began weeding out the ships of least less suitable for long-term habitation, selling them and pooling the money to buy larger, more space-worthy hulls. This process is ongoing as vessels wear out and break down. While some ships while some ships enjoy dedicated cabins with full privacy and sanitary facilities, many more are former freighters whose cargo bays and containers are, pa are pressurized and divided into family spaces using simple metal cubicle bulkheads. These Koreans live in these austere spaces with colorful quilts and tapestries, which also help muffle sound. The day-to-day -day operations of the fleet, traffic control, station keeping, supply distribution, and so on are under military jurisdiction. The ship captains have the authority to deviate from their assigned positions and may leave the fleet at any time. They are assumed to do so at their own risk. As the migrant fleet moves around the galaxy, many ships split off to pursue individual goals, returning days or years later. Alright, the pilgrimage. When a quarry of the migrant fleet reaches adulthood, they must leave their birth ship and find a new crew to accept them as a permanent residence. To provide themselves to prove themselves they must recover something of value. This is offered for to their prospective captain as proof that they will not be a mere burden to the shoestring resources on the ship. This process is called the pilgrimage. Stripped of ritual, the, pi the pilgrimage is merely an attempt to maintain genetic diversity within the small, relatively isolated population bases that make up the migrant fleet. If the young stayed and married with their bird vessel, the risk of inbreeding would increase sharply. Orians are surgically fit with their various immunity-boosting implants in preparation for leaving on pilgrimage. Having grown up with the sterile controlled environments of the migrant fleet ships Koreans have virtually no natural immune system which is why they're so susceptible to disease all right oh boy oh boy i'm getting sick of reading but we still have a decent amount to go let's start at the bottom work our way up all right easy upgrades development of practical manufacturing Omni tools allows modern militaries a great deal of flexibility in equipment loadouts. A vast number of field modification kits or upgrades are available for common equipment such as weapons, armor, omni tools, biotic amps, and even grenades. An upgrade kit typically consists of less than a dozen unique parts and an optical storage disk. When loaded into an omni tool, the OSD provides all technical specifications required to manufacture the tool and additional parts necessary to install the upgrade onto another piece of equipment. Assembly is typically modular, and installation can be completed in less than a minute. Since Omni tools are designed to use common battlefield salvage materials such as plastic, ceramics, and light materials rendered into semi-molten Omni gel for quick use, it is quite possible for a trained soldier carrying upgrade kits to customize gear on the battlefield to fit the current tactical situation. Tech. All right, biotics. Biotic implants and amplifiers only provide the potential to create coherent mass effect fields. Whether biotics can actually do so is largely determined by their training. 
Biotics must con develop conscious control over their nervous system, sending specific electrical impulses to the element zero nodules embedded in their nerves. They are taught to use their implants and amps with biofeedback devices and physical mnemonics. Specific gestures or muscle movements fire the proper sequence of nerves to activate a certain skill. Kinetics Industries pioneered biotic training with the bio Biotic Acclimation and Temperance Training Program. Although BOT did not achieve desire, the desired results, many techniques taught are still used today. Many humans think many human think tanks are trying to develop some form of biotic super soldier. Most are benign efforts to create more flexible troops. Others, less publicly known, are unapologetic attempts to create Nietzschean? Nietzschean Superman. Of course. Alright, communications. Real-time communication is possible thanks to networks of expansive of expensive mass relay com buoys that can daisy chain a transmitted via lasers. Transmission via lasers. Com buoys are maintained in pattern built outward from each mass in patterns built outward from each mass relay. The buoys are little relays. Each individual buoy is connected to a partner on another buoy in the network, forming a corridor of low mass space. Tight beam communications lasers are piped through these tubes of FTL space, allowing virtually instantaneous communication to anywhere on the network. The networks connect across regions by communications lasers through the mass relays. With this system, the only communications delay is the light lag between the source of or destination and the closest buoy. So as long as parties remain within half a light second, 150,000 kilometers of buoys, the seamless real-time communications are possible. Since buoys are maintained in all traveled areas, most enjoy unlimited instant communication. Ships only suffer communications lag when operating off established deep space routes around uninhabited outer system gas giants. In other unsettled areas during wartime, combo-y networks are the first target of an attack. Once the network is severed, it can take anywhere from weeks to years to get a message out of a contested system. In systems where a buoy network has not yet been built or has been destroyed, rapid communication means ferrying information through high-speed courier ships and unmanned data drones. Alright. Administration. While combos allow rapid transmission, there is a finite amount of bandwidth available. Given that trillions of people may be trying to pass a message through a given buoy at one time, access to the network is parceled out on priority tiers. The Citadel Council and the Spectres have absolute priority. If they are using all the bandwidth, everyone else must wait. Individual governments and their militaries enjoy the next highest tier. During wartime, civilian communication can suffer hours or even days of lag. Intelligence agencies study ping time through various systems to predict military buildups. Oof. Uh, below the governments and militaries, bandwidth priority is sold to the highest bidder. Media conglomerates, particularly headline news networks, purchase higher priority to provide their viewers with timely information. Corporations that require timely information and response capability, for example, financial institutions and investment firms, also invest heavily in priority access. The funds acquired through sales of bandwidth are used to maintain and expand the communications infrastructure. While everyone has a, with a computer has guaranteed free and unlimited access to the Galactic Extranet, they are last in line for bandwidth and may have to wait for their requests to be processed. Bandwidth free sale corporations use investment capital to purchase blocks of high priority access made available by paid subscription. Capitalism at its finest. All right, I hope we don't have too much more to read because I am dying over here. Oh, fuck. All right. Oh, set up conventions. These diplomatic talks occurred in the wake of the Krogan rebellions as a response to the destruction of the conflict and the attempt to Distance the council from the brutal Krogan warfare. The conventions regulate the use of weapons of mass destruction. A WMD causes environmental alteration to a world. A bomb that produces a large crater 
It's not considered a WMD. A bomb that causes a nuclear winter is. Use of WMD is a forbidden on garden worlds like Earth, while ecospheres that can readily support a population. If a habitable world is destroyed, it will not be replaced for millions of years. The conventions do not forbid the use of WMD on hostile worlds or in sealed space station environments. Many militaries continue to develop and maintain stockpiles. The conventions graded weapons of mass destruction into tiers of concern. Tier 1 is the greatest threat to galactic peace. Large kinetic impactors such as asteroid drops or deorbiting space stations. Efficiently free and available in any system form of debris left over from planetary accretion. Kinetic impactors are the weapon of choice for terrorists and third galaxy nations. Tier 2. Uncontrolled self-replicating weapons such as nanotechnology, viral, or bacteriological organisms. Von Neumann devices and destructive computer viruses. These weapons can these weapons can lie dormant for millennia waiting for a careless visitor to carry them to another world. Tier 3. Large energy burst weapons such as nuclear or antimatter warhead. And Tier 4. Alien species deliberately introduced to crowd out native forms necessary for the health of an ecosystem. Ecological tampering can take years to bear fruit, making it difficult to prove. Right. Citadel Station, CSEC. CSEC is a volunteer police service answering to the Citadel Council. Sorry. The 200,000 constables of CSEC are responsible for maintaining public order in a densely populated Citadel. They also provide pirate suppression, customs enforcement, and search and rescue throughout the Citadel cluster. CSEC has six divisions. Enforcement, uniformed officers who patrol the Citadel and respond to emergencies. Investigation, detectives who puzzle out the truth behind crimes and bring perpetrators to justice. Customs, screens the thousands of passengers and cargo containers that pass through the Citadel's ports every day. Network deals with cyber crimes like identity and copyright theft, hacking and viral attacks, and illegal artificial intelligence. Special response deals with hostage situations like bombs and heavily armed criminals. In the unlikely event that attackers board the Citadel, they're also the front line of defense, armed with military grade equipment. Patrol. Naval arm was shipped stationed throughout the Citadel Cluster. Unlike the other divisions, they are rarely seen at the Citadel, nor do they stay in one place for long. Joining CG CSEC is prestigious. Applications must be sponsored by a Citadel counselor or the ambassador of an association of an associate council race. Generally, applicants have many years of distinguished service in the military or police forces of their nation. But an inexperienced applicant with dem demonstrable talent will be fairly considered. CSEC inspectors are often at odds. Many CSEC members, notably current executor Vinari Palin, believe that allowing inspectors to be above the law is a dangerous practice. The actions of Saren Artrarius lend credence to, the, to this position. The specters, in turn, are aggravated when CSEC's dedication to procedure and due process hampers their investigations. A little butting of heads there. Being said a little up and ups. Alright, the Presidium Ring. The ring is enclosed atop of a park-like space, serving as the connection point for the wards. The interior walls are lined with embassies of influential species and private residences of the galaxy's elite. The Presidium is full of open-air restaurants, bars, and luxurious meeting areas. Gravity is about one-third Earth's normal. A holographic sky is projected over the ceiling of the ring. Unlike the 24-7 bustle of the wards, the Presidium maintains a 20-hour day schedule with a 6-hour night schedule where lights are dimmed and the sky goes through a night cycle. Offices and residences are often open to the interior. 
It is not unusual for embassies to have no exterior wall at all. This does not cause a crime problem due to the heavy CSEC presence and ubiquitous monitoring devices on the Presidium. Thieves are quickly identified and apprehended. The ring is in the location of the Citadel spaceports. Being closer to the center of the spin, there is less motion for a ship to match, and then reduced spin gravity. And the reduced spin gravity makes handling cargo easier. Hundreds of ships pass through the Citadel every day, and every species of an embassy is granted a private dock. The tower at the center of the ring holds the administration of the Citadel Council. The tower rises over a kilometer over from the ring, appearing to thrust forward parallel to the wide to the ward arms. Jesus. Ah deep breath. As the tower is at the center of the spin axis, it experiences little centrifugal force. Gravity is maintained using mass effect fields at a 90 degree angle to the ring and wards. A consular dock can be found at the base of the tower. While normally used for diplomatic couriers and specter business, the shuttles docked here can evacuate the council government in an emergency. The Serpent Nebula the Citadel is surrounded by a blue tinted reflection nebula. The light of the nebula is actually from the Citadel scattered and reflected back at the station. At first, the Serpent Nebula is assumed to be made of microscopic construction debris. The prevailing theory holds that the Protheans use molecular nanotechnology to manufacture the incredibly durable materials used in the Citadel. But unlike other nebulae, the serpent does not dissipate over time, therefore it must be replenished constantly. The current popular theory is that the non-recyclable waste collected by the Citadel's keepers is somehow rendered down to the atomic or molecular level and injected into the cloud. The thick nebula presents a navigation hazard. Beyond the relatively clear areas around the Citadel, electrical discharges are common. They are not blocked by kinetic barriers and can severely damage metal frame starships. In addition, some dense knots of dust can overwhelm the repulsion of kinetic barriers on smaller ships. If such a vessel is moving fast enough at the time, the effects are similar to being hit by a sand blaster. Attempting to reach Citadel through the Citadel through open space navigation is unadvisable. The only safe approach is through the various mass with relays in orbit. Statistics Although the Citadel is equipped with mass effect generating element zero cores, most of the gravity on the station is generated with centrifugal force of rotation. It rotates 3.5 minutes per revolution. The gravity in the wards is 1.2 of Earth's. And the proscenium is 0.3% of Earth's. Total length is 44.7 kilometers. Diameter is 12.8 kilometers when open. Ward lengths are 43 kilometers. And the widths are 330 meters. Sodium ring diameter is 7.2 kilometers. With a width of 553 meters. Exterior armor thickness is 13 meters. 13.2 million population, not including keepers. Gross weight is 7.11 billion metric tons. And the height of the Presidium Tower is 1,047 meters. The wards. The majority of the Citadel populations live in the wards, the five massive arms of the station that house the residential and commercial districts. Many galactic races have established cultural enclaves here. Population density and cost of living are extremely high, akin to Earth cities such as Hong Kong or Singapore. The wards are open top skyscrapers rising from superstructures. Towers are sealed against vacuum. As a breathable atmosphere envelope is only maintained at to a height of about seven meters. The atmosphere is contained by a centrifugal force, a rotation in a membrane of dense colorless sulfur, hexafluoride gas, held in place by carefully managed mass effect fields. The view from the wards is spectacular. 
In the background, stars, Serpent Nebula, and other nearby blue giant called the Widow move across the sky. Excuse me. As the station rotates to stabilize itself. In the foreground, the lights of buildings and vehicles on the opposing ward arms perpetually shine. Settle has no real day or night. While the station keeps to standard galactic time for political functions, business rarely closes and residents acclimate to sleep and work accordingly to personal need rather than day and night cycle. Additions and modifications are constantly being constructed, though they must stay certain specifications within certain specifications that will not compromise the observation of the station. Occasionally, the keepers will descend on an area of the wards and move or change the architecture without explanation. Residents have learned to live with these inexplicable intrusions. All right, the Treaty of Ferrizen. Due to the destructive potential of dreadnoughts, the Council races a treaty to the Ferrizen Naval Conference to fix a ratio of dreadnought destruction between themselves. At the top of the pyramid is the peacekeeping Turian fleet. Below the Turians are the other Asari Council or are the other Council races. Currently, the Asari Solarians. Council associates are at the bottom. The human systems alliance is part of this last group. The ratio of Turian to Council to associate dreadnoughts is 531. For every dreadnought humans are permitted to build, the Asarius have three and the Turians have five. Interesting. Oh, man. Okay. Humanity and the Systems Alliance. Oh, you know what? I think this is the end of our uh, history lesson for your class. I can't. <laughs> I will actually die. So, we got through a good chunk of it. We're going to return to regular scheduled gameplay next time. And later on in the series, I will return and do some more codex stuff. But, oh, I am shot after that. <laughs> oh, man. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Take care. I hope my uh, voice didn't annoy you too much. Because I know it annoyed me, and fuck, I need some water. <laughs> Take care. <laughs>